please join me welcoming Ken and Tina to the patch into the state force. I never quite understood uh, the rivalry between uh, Louisville and, and Kentucky. You know, <laughs> I understand a little bit better now the competition between blue and red. I'll tell you a quick story. We were here about six months and uh, our kids started school and Christiana was in kindergarten at the time and she came home from school and she had a coloring project to do. And as she was doing this coloring project, very intent, focused on it, um, she looked up at, at Tina and I and she said, can I use the color blue? <laughs>
you will help other people grow and reach your potential. And I'll tell you a little story about my own experience in leadership and competition because early on in my, in my own growth, I, I saw competition very selfishly. I saw it as an opportunity to help me. Competition was all about the wins or losses. It was all about uh, the championships. It was all about possibly the next opportunity, the next coaching job, or the payday that came along with that. And what I found was that competition, when competition surrounded that, it was a very selfish and narrow and limiting experience. That I was, I was competing just for that championship, which was temporary. I read, a, I read an article at one point, though, and, and uh, I know the Duke is a, is a sore point for many of you, but one of, <laughs> one of, my, one of my role models in, in growing up and having gone to Duke University was Coach K, and there's an article that was written about him, and they said, how come at the university or at Duke University, you guys find all these great leaders who have this program that has had a lot of success and all these people of good character, how do you find them? He said, we don't find them, we develop them. And it was at that point that I realized in, in my mind that my responsibility was not just about me and what I could get, it was about developing the people that were under my tutelage. It was about helping them grow. It was helping them reach another level. And I, uh, what happened was I took the eyes off of myself. I took the focus off of me and my growth and my achievements and started putting them on others. And as soon as I did that, my career took off. And what we do at the University of Louisville is now focus on three actions, three words, three things that help us keep focus on what the importance of competition is and how to take advantage of the competition for the growth of these young people. The first thing is, is envision. For you as leaders, the one thing you need to have more than anything else is a goal, is a direction for yourselves, a purpose for what you do. And for us in, at the University of Louisville, we need to have a vision of where we want to go and what we do. Again, when we got to the University of Louisville, there was uh, a program that was struggling at best. They'd never been to the NCAA tournament. The year before I got here, were 5, 10, and 3. For us, we needed a vision because there was no history for us to recruit. There was nothing for us to sell to these people that in the past we could say, hey, look, this is what we will do for you. So we had to sell our own vision. We had to sell our own ideas. We had to give a direction to what we do. It was uh, Christopher Columbus that said, I will freely give my vision for the future to others, and as they see the belief in my eyes, they will follow. And how critical it is that not only that you cast that vision, but the belief in your eyes as you move forward. The belief that this is hopeful, not only hopeful, but possible. That the reality is there, and it was on our way. There are, there are a lot, so many stories about Christopher Columbus, and and on their, uh, their journey to the new, new world, he every morning would get out and walk to the absolute front of the boat. And he cast his eyes over the water, and all it was was water, miles and miles of water. And what he would do is very loudly, he would proclaim and in great detail talk about the land that he could see. In great detail. Every morning. He freely gave his vision to others. He spoke about what he could see, what he envisioned. And because of that, the crew followed, the people followed. Part of envisioning is not only casting a vision for the future, but it's also casting a vision of what is possible for the people we lead. Because each and every one of us has a gift. That ability to find the gifts in others is so critical. It's what we do at the University of Louisville. When they come in, they come from all different areas. Our goal is to find the gift that they have in them and continue to develop that. And you see, every one of us has a different gift. I'll tell you a quick story, and I think, I think Tracy heard this story when I spoke at the, uh, at the Rotary. My, my dad is an avid golfer. He, he loves to golf, and, but he has a, a struggle with seeing. As he gets older, he struggles to see the ball, so it's important that he, he plays with people that have good vision. Well, he went to the golf course the one day, and, and the guys that he normally plays with didn't show up, and it was a beautiful day, gorgeous day, crisp, clear, warm, wonderful day to play. He was so excited, but he didn't have his normal group to play with. 
So he's walking around the club and he's a little bit down and depressed and he's trying to find somebody to play with and he sits down in the chair and he's just, he relegated himself to the fact that he probably wasn't going to play that day. When an older man comes up, a little bit older than my dad, and he says, what's going on? He says, well, I wanted to play today, but I, you know, I didn't have my buddies here. I, I have a little bit of trouble seeing the ball and if I play on my own, I, I, there's no way I'm going to make it through the round. And he says, well, I can help you. He says, I, I have great vision. I have wonderful vision. I'll, I'll go out with you, and, and you, you know what? I'll just track the ball for you. He said, you can. He said, wonderful. So they put him in a car, drove to the first tee, and he's getting ready to tee off and dresses the ball. And he says, you're ready. And he, the older man says, yeah, I'm ready. I'm, you know, I, I'm, I can see. I'm good. So he hits the ball straight down the fairway, and he says, did you see it? And the guy says, yeah, I, I saw it. He says, are you sure? He says, yeah, I saw it the whole way. He says, where'd it go? He says, I forgot. <laughs> Some different than others. Our role as leaders and what you do here is identifying those gifts in each other and pulling them out. Seeing the gifts, envisioning the gifts in each other is a critical part of what we do. It's a critical part of what you do here. And in that competitive environment, sometimes we get lost in it. Use that competitive environment to draw the best out in each other. We so much value this, and, and, and Tina, if you can grab this, that, that we all have a gift, and we wanted to donate this. Tina and I wrote a book called Finding Your Gifts, and it's all about that, that people are different, that we all have different gifts, but in those gifts is our purpose, is who we are. So again, we, we want to donate that to the, to the library here, and uh, just wanted to make sure that Tracy and the, and the uh, people here have that for the, for the kids. Uh, the second thing that we focus on is encouragement. It's one thing to find the gifts, it's then to nurture those gifts and encourage those gifts. Mark Twain once said, I can live two months on a good compliment. We focus in, on for, fostering the growth through encouragement. There's a book called Well Done, and in the book Well Done, it, it, um, it demonstrates how they train killer whales in SeaWorld, which is incredible. They take the most dangerous predators in the sea and what they do is they put them in captivity and then teach them to do whatever they want, which is incredible. And, and this is how they do it. That, for example, if they want them to jump over the rope outside of the water, if they put the rope out of the water, they want them to jump over it, what they do is they start by putting it 10 meters off the bottom of the tank. And every time this animal swims over it, they love it and hug it and feed it. And, and then they raise it another 10 meters and every time they swim over it, they love it and hug it and feed it. Pretty soon they have it 10 meters outside of the water and it's jumping over it. Why? Because it wants to be loved and hugged and fed. <laughs> We're no different. We all want to be loved and hugged and fed and reinforced that way. Now what they don't do if it swims under it, what they don't do is whip it because they'll be eaten. <laughs> yeah. What they do is they redirect the behavior so they can catch them jumping over it so they can love them and hug them and feed them. It's what you do here. I look at the walls and everything that's written on the walls. It's all about the encouragement. It's all about catching them doing them right. And in that competitive environment, which you're going to live in now, to help this get to a better place, use words of encouragement to foster that. To foster your own growth and your own expectations of reaching a certain level. There is nothing more powerful than the words that we speak. Our words have the power to give life or take it away. In our words, we can encourage people to grow or drag them down. There's a story about black crabs in Hawaii. They're indigenous to Hawaii, and, and they brought the, uh, captured these black crabs and eaten, and they're milling around on the, on the bottom of the bucket. And one of the black crabs looks up because he's barely living and barely surviving. He looks up and he sees on the top of the bucket light. So he lifts his claw up and he strains to pull himself up, and it's incredible what he sees outside of the bucket. It's life. It's the water. It's the beach. 
So he looks down to the rest of them. He said, you, you wouldn't believe what's up here. This is life. It's freedom. And he puts his claw down there to lift them up. And they all lift it up and pull them back down into the body. You see, sometimes because of our own insecurities, our own doubts, we pull back people to where we are to make ourselves feel better about where we are rather than lifting them out to higher levels. Our words are so powerful, there is no more power that we have than to push people up with our words and our encouragement and just positive things. It is so powerful. One of the areas that for us in a competitive environment that we continue to lift each other up is in the words of what we say moving them forward. Love them and hug them and feed them with your words every single day. The, the last thing is, is the empowerment. Because what we ultimately want to do is empower the kids that we have to get to another level. To hold them accountable, yet provide that opportunity. We want to push them on so that, again, they have those opportunities to continue to grow and make decisions on their own and do things for themselves. Provide that hope that they have that ability to do that. In a competitive environment, it is critical that we continue to push each other on into a situation where we have the self-awareness and the self-confidence that we can do it on our own and then hold ourselves accountable to our actions. Continue to give them the support and the encouragement, but ultimately we want to make them able to influence other people as well. There was a story early on in, in our career when we're building a culture at the University of, of Louisville that that culture was critical, that we wanted to, to allow them that opportunity to grow and hold them accountable. One of the ways we do that is time. There's no, no uh, better way and more valuable asset we have than time. And for us, you need to show up on time for training or you miss the opportunity to participate that day. Time for me, and a little bit of sidebar, but time for me is, is one of the great democracies of life because how we manage our time in life will dictate our success. And it doesn't matter whether you're the President of the United States or maybe the guy on the, on the corner begging for food, we all have 24 hours a day. It's how we use that time will dictate our success. So we, we impart that on to our players that time is valuable and we have to respect each other's time. So the one day, we're training up at Traeger Center about half a mile from where we, we, we dress. And at this morning, about 20, 30 minutes before training starts, one of the players isn't in the locker room. The other two guys next to his locker see this. So they quickly call him up on the phone and say, OT, where are you? OT's woken up from asleep. He says, oh my goodness, my alarm didn't go off, I'm not sure. And quickly, they devise a plan. They say, look, we'll gather your stuff, we'll meet you somewhere on the quad, and then we'll go up from there. So they get the stuff together, and OT gets out of bed, half-dressed, half and he gets and meets him in the quad, and he's putting on his stuff. And these two guys that meet him there, taking responsibility, helping him out, realize they forgot their own soccer shoes. <laughs> so now they got to go back to the locker room and then get up to Traeger. In the meantime, OT's getting dressed and he's making his way up there. So I'm up at Traeger, I'm getting ready for practice, putting all the combs down and vest up and everything like that. And I know what's going on because of some of the players that are coming in. So I'm watching the clock and it's getting close to eight. Sure enough, before eight when we start training, OT comes in. <sighs> Ran the whole way and he's just before. Eight o'clock comes, the other two guys aren't showing up when we start training. And OT has a look on his face, a long look, and he's slumped over a little bit. Barely going through the exercises, because he's watching the door and the clock as well. Sure enough, a couple minutes after eight, the other two coming in, also, and I said to him, I said, you guys, they started walking over to me. I know what happened. You're late. So what you need to do is help facilitate training. You're not participating today. And now OT's eyes got really big, and he knew what had happened. So now he's barely moving through the first part of training. So he's moved from there onto the function, we get to the next part of training, and now I see him walking over. He's coming towards me, and I'm walking away. I don't even want to talk to him. I don't want to see him, and I'm walking away. He said, coach, coach, and I'm ignoring him. He finally gets too close, I can't ignore him. I said, OT, what's going on? What's up? He said, it's not fair. It's not fair. I should be the one not training, not those guys. 
It's because of me that they are late. And because of me, they're not training today. And I said, OT, oh, you're right. But we have rules. And the rule says you need to be here at 8 o'clock. Those guys came afterwards. But what they provided you is a gift. Today, those two guys, because of their actions, provided you a gift. And right now, you're wasting that gift. The only way you can honor that gift is by being everything you can be today. And then you make their actions worth it. He was unbelievable the rest of the training. In fact, not only was he tremendous, he rose the level of our team. I was a better coach that day. We were a better team because he honored the gift that was given him. And I challenge you today that the gifts that you've been given, using it in a competitive environment, is not only for yourself, but raise the level of everybody else around you to make this a better organization, to make this a better place, to provide better opportunities for the kids. Because you know, we're all the greatest miracle in the world. We've all been given that gift. Gandhi once said, he said, be the change that you want to see in the world. We need to be the change that we want to see in the kids here. We need to be the leaders that focus on a vision, on encouragement, on empowerment. And in doing so, raise the level of what's going on here. Use that competitive environment to fuel the passion and the desire to want to raise it to another level. This is a wonderful group. There's no question the leadership here has risen it to where it is today, which is phenomenal. But what we all know standing here in this room is there's a whole other level still. I encourage you, I, I implore you to use the gifts you have to make each other even better still and get it to another level. Thank you very much. Thank you.